Hello YouTube and uh, my fellow few subscribers I have out there. I thought it was time that I do a one year review of my Garmin Panoptics Live Scope. Uh, best portable unit out there. I gotta be honest, I haven't watched very many videos lately on uh, portable units, uh, but I still think mine kind of holds up with the market and what people have put out there as far as usefulness and uh, for a cheap setup that you can build yourself and all the uses it has. I think it's uh, for my first try out, it turned out very well. I have very few things I was unsatisfied with it, but we'll kind of be going over them today. Just kind of want to give you the things I liked, didn't like, changed, uh, what worked, what didn't. Um, but we'll just start off and uh, kind of going over the setup. If you watched my uh, first video, uh, not much has changed except for some of my homemade stickers. Couldn't really stand up to the test of time and kind of peeled off, but they're just kind of for fun and show, so... Once they started kind of coming loose, just kind of peeled them off and threw them away. It was it was just for fun. I've had some questions on what kind of mount this is. This is a Johnny Ray JR300 swivel mount. I got this off of eBay uh, for about, I got two of them for $12.00. Because uh, they were used, they had, like the mounting plates had been chewed down, like from their regular size down to this smaller size for whatever fish finder they had mounted on it. Well, I had to make this base plate, which is quarter inch thick, HDPE, uh, and actually I think it was two plate two eighth inch plates I stuck together glued sanded down mounted them to this plate and then mounted my bracket to that you can see the screws coming through here to hold it down and I've been out in four or five foot white cap rollers and haven't had any problems with this mount bouncing around too bad or coming loose it just pops in and swivels to whatever direction you want. Just very simple little mount, nothing too extravagant, but uh, for this size of monitor, this is a 93 SV unit. Uh, so kind of mid-size, not huge, but not small. Uh, overall, perfect size for what my use was um, one thing I did add for my original video this here is just a cell phone magnetic mount uh, pick these up at Costco Best Buy Sam's Club where you have a magnetic sticker you put on the back of your phone that sticks to these they hold very well and I actually run the Hummingbird uh, Fish Smart app off my phone because uh, anybody who probably tried out various kinds of uh, fish finders, mapping units, in my opinion, the Hummingbird uh, Lake Maps uh, Fish Smart app provides uh, like their base maps are way better than the Navionics maps that are provided by Garmin or Lowrance. At least on most of the lakes I fish. Uh, I mostly fish Fort Peck Lake in Montana. And you have to pay $30 just to get the detailed map of Fort Peck Lake because it is a very large reservoir. Uh, most maps run $10, $15, $20 depending on how large of a lake and how large of a file you have to download, but you can, instead of downloading a whole region, you can kind of go in and pick lake specific maps. That's, and that's all you need. So 
while I'm running the live scope on the Garmin, I run the lake maps, the Hummingbird lake maps uh, GPS off my phone, which I can plug into the unit off my accessories port if my phone battery is running low to kind of keep it going. And that way I can store waypoints in my phone that if I want to use later for ice fishing, I can bring this whole unit back out ice fishing with my phone. And even if the lake level has changed, I can come back to a spot that I had good luck on or marked for good structure and give it a try ice fishing. Um, you'll have to forgive me. This is all nothing scripted or nothing. I'm kind of just shooting from the hip and trying to give you a review. So we'll see how it goes. Um, what I do like about this unit, this handle in the back, since it is a rolling unit, works really well to kind of hang the transducer arm off the back and wrap the extra wire that, uh, goes to the transducers around that and kind of makes for easier storage so that's an added plus for like i've seen portable units that just are just solid cases that is an added plus that that handle does help out to kind of something to hang the mast off um i internally Here's all the electronics. It's kind of a cluttered mess, but everything does fit inside. I can take this unit off and stick it inside and put it in for long-term storage. Inside are two 12 volt, 15 amp hour batteries. And those turned out to be about the perfect size for what I was wanting. I was able to go out and go fishing for eight or nine hours and those two batteries were able to run my unit for that length of time i mean it's not a steady run the whole time every time we had pick up to move locations i'd shut the unit off pull everything in once we got to the new location i could power everything back on get the transducer set back out and start going again so in an eight hour fishing day, it was probably getting a good six to seven hours of use. And I never ran out of battery power. I, ne I do have the capability of coming off a 12 volt plug and hooking into the bolts, the boat's 12 volts at volt system to power this unit. But I was always hoping to try to stay on the internal batteries. And I said all summer that I fished with this, it was able to make pretty much all day runs. I mean, I'm not a diehard fisherman as I used to be where I could be out for 12, 14 hours in a day. Generally, four or five hours, which I could pretty much run off of just one battery, would get most of my day's worth of fishing. I'd pull this unit out of the boat at the end of the day, take it back to the cabin, charge it out, charge that one battery I ran on all day, charge it back to full, and I was good to go the next day. Which, this unit is kind of, with the two 12-volt, 15-amp batteries, this unit is kind of heavy. It runs right around 40 pounds. It... it with the handles on the side, it's not too awkward to pick up and move and carry. It doesn't seem to weigh that much. But, you know, being 40 pounds, getting in and out of a boat that might be rolling from waves hitting the dock. I'll be honest, I took a pretty good header one day trying to climb out of the boat with this thing and my foot clipped on the boat handrail when a wave come across the, the dock. Knocked me right on my butt. The monitor come flying off the unit out into the water, but it was easily enough retrieved. Let it dry, plugged it back in, and everything worked fine. No, no big deal. But trying to move a 40-pound unit around, getting in and out of a boat, 
can be a problem. The, the biggest weight of this thing is the 12 volt 15 amp hour batteries. That is almost 20 pounds of the 40 pound weight. I went with those because I got the two of the batteries off of eBay for like $55. They're decent sized batteries. I was hoping that size of battery would get me eight to 10 hours of run time. And so far that's my calculations have kind of worked out to the amp hours for what the draw for this monitor and the transducer. Those two 12 volt 15 amp hours seem to make that kind of run time. I'm kind of hoping maybe in the future that I usually, most all my po home power tools are Ryobi's and they have come out with an 18 volt, nine amp hour uh, lithium ion battery. I'm hoping I can at some point catch them on sale. Uh, sometimes they run two for one battery sales and they run about $120, $130 a piece. If I can catch them on sale, I'd like to get them, since I already run Ryobi tools anyways, I could use them, modify them into this box, and run off those batteries, and basically use my other six or eight Ryobi batteries I have all as batteries that can power this unit. It, I've seen other people use 18 volt power tool batteries to power systems like this. So it can be done. Uh, Garmin, from what I've seen, is fine using 18 volt power sources. If you get anything much over 20, it can void your warranty if you over amp or over voltage the unit so i wouldn't recommend ever going over 18 volts everything i seen from garmin said they were fine up to 18 volts uh, you can get voltage regulators that can turn your 18 volts down to 12 volts and maybe get a little extra life out of that battery uh, by not just wasting voltage that's not necessary but I'd have to wait until I change over to that system to really say, do you get additional voltage or battery life turning it down from 18 volts to 12 volts and not wasting your voltage? You know, well, I'd have to wait and see how that turns out to give a honest review if that works. Um, if I come over here, here's the transducer I work. Uh, this is a Brocraft telescoping transducer. I got this for $75 off of eBay. Um, it worked very well. I never had any huge problems with it. It's, it's not the ideal setup for this. Uh, as the C-clamp only goes to about two, two and a half inches wide, which is mostly made just to go on the rear transom. I usually mounted this up in the front of the boat. You can see this little wooden block in here. This was kind of the prototype mount that I used to kind of move around the boat until I found the spot I wanted to mount it in. I just held it in place with big C clamps on the back here with, uh, you know, just clamp it in right to the gunnel in the front. And once I found where I wanted to permanently mount a block, I made a L-shaped wooden block kind of like this, except it was made out of teak wood that is a little more durable to water and, you know, just doesn't fall apart as easy as just most woods do. Teak is kind of their preferred wood for on boats for water exposure. So this is kind of what I have mounted in the front of my boat. It's a little, the one I permanently mounted is a little smaller 
more just size to fit this C clamp on here and go from there. But it worked very well. Uh, I could deploy my trolling motor and it's an Altera. So by the time it auto deployed, I could usually have this mounted back out into the water and have my unit turning back on by the time everything got deployed i had everything back up and running by the time i was moved uh, and ready to go um, i do have several videos on my page that kind of go over different fishing scenarios i had the biggest complaint i have about this 93 sv unit is currently you can't screen share from the monitor to your phone to where you can record what's on the monitor onto your phone i was hoping to be able to get a bunch of videos of different fishing situations i'd run through um, but if you watch my videos the only way i could do it was to physically hold the camera in front of the monitor and film it well i'm trying to fish run the trolling motor watch the chart film so you can imagine it's kind of tough to try to do four different things at one time to where if i'd have had if it could have screen shared i'd have had a lot more videos out there showing different applications that i use this for i mean you can find hundreds of videos on youtube showing this unit in action vertical jigging are anchored and flip casting out in front of the boat where you can see a school of fish out in front of you and it, it works phenomenally well from that for that application that's there's so many videos out there showing that for crappie bass jigging off structures we all know that that this thing works excellent for that application so what i try to do was show other applications i i'm not much of a crappie or bass fisherman i fish for walleye pike i catch a lot of smallmouth bass just in the process but it's not what i'm going for um, I have videos showing some salmon fishing with downriggers and what you can and can't see looking down that deep and that far back. Uh, pulling crankbaits, pulling bottom bouncers. Um, I just wanted to show other applications that you can use for this besides vertical jigging. Now the most part like here's the transducer setup. This is looking forward. This is just your traditional down looking sonar. Um, usually, in most applications, I would not have that transducer looking forward. I would have it looking backwards behind the boat. Uh, in the looking behind me like this thing shoots 135 degree angle so when it's in this forward looking view it's looking 45 degrees to the front or one way in 90 degrees back that way so if this is your direction of travel you're looking 45 degrees ahead and 90 degrees behind you and if I was pulling a bottom bouncer or a crankbait, it took a little finagling around, getting the angle, like uh, put your pole out, let it run behind, and you could turn this and find just the right angle where you could see your rig on the bottom, 20 feet behind you, 40 feet behind you. Honestly, I'd say about 50, 60 feet is about as far behind you that you could pick up like a crankbait rig that was down like 15 20 feet running off the bottom if you're a long line crankbaiter that likes to run 100 140 foot back you're probably not going to be able to see your crankbaits that far back it's just too far you lose all 
all your resolution. Um, but at 50 feet, 20 feet down, I you could you can make out your crankbait. You're not going to make out as much detailed structure. You might be able to pick out a larger fish following behind your crankbait, but a lot of the details are lost. You know, you get much further behind than 20, 30 feet. You start losing a lot of detail, but you can pick out fish following your lures, following your bottom bouncer, following the crankbait, seeing if they're responding to jigging, jigging the line, deadlining it, just giving it slack and letting the lure stop. You can see if fish are reacting to that or not, which is one thing I got to say was it was fun to watch but also frustrating. I don't know how many times I could have a fish, especially walleye, which are very picky biters, would follow the rigs for minutes. Just follow behind the rig and never bite. They might take a soft bite if you could feel it, but they're such a soft biter and so cautious on sometimes when they're eating that I, I would try jigging it, I'd try dead pulling it, I'd, I'd try anything I could think of, try to, to react a bite. And some fish just would not ever go for it. They'd just follow your line, follow your line. And so it's one of them things, it was really fun to watch, but just another frustration when you know you have fish following your rig and you just can't get them to trigger a bite. So it's one of them things. It was absolutely fun to watch fish react to your line out. You know, you know, it's one thing to go by an arc and say, okay, there's a fish there. But to see that fish go from sitting on the bottom to start to follow your line and you can raise and lower your jig off the bottom, your, your bottom bouncer off the bottom and you can see it following your rig around, maybe even taking a flash at it a couple times, but you just can't get it on there, you know. So it, it, it added a whole nother level of frustration sometimes when you could see that happening and you just couldn't get it to bite. So one of the pluses, great fun to watch. I have never been so entertained while not catching fish. Just watching fish react to different jigs, different lures, different bottom bouncers, different presentations. You know, there was several times I'd be going along and I'd see a suspended pike like five, six feet off the bottom with a bottom bouncer. And I could pick that bottom bouncer right up into its face. And right when I'd go by it, boom, it would hit, you know. Would I have caught that pike if I didn't see it suspended you know, off the bottom and could put it right in front of its nose, knew exactly how far to lift that bottom bouncer off the bottom to put it right in front of it? Probably not. And the same goes with walleyes. There was many times I could see a walleye sitting right on the bottom, just sitting there, and I could see right, you know, right when my bottom bouncer got to it, I could drop my bottom bouncer and just stop it and let that rig sit right in front of it for the three or four seconds you have while your boat's going by that could trigger that fish to bite. And would have I seen it on a traditional sonar? Would have I been able to stop that rig right in front of its nose? If I was a professional fisherman and spent hundreds of hours every year on the lake fishing, maybe I could have, but your casual fisherman like myself anymore, I think it does present opportunities that you might not normally have been able to catch. You know, if you can see exactly where your lure is at, exactly where the fish is at, and try different things to see if it'll make it bite. It does help, you know. 
Um, far as the different applications I've had, I've the first application I have is a vi you can find in my video. It's called Hunting River Monsters. It's fishing for paddlefish uh, or spoonbill cats. They're called. These fish get up to in Montana. They get up to about 140 pounds. Uh, they're just bottom feeders. They actually just filter out uh, microscopic planktons and phytoplanktons, whatever you want to call. They don't feed on minnows. You can't catch them on bait. You have to cast out a big treble hook with a heavy weight and rip it across the bottom until you snag them. And uh, in that video, I show us catching in a couple of them. This was the first application I used uh, for this setup. And all my fishermen buddies that I go paddle fishing with every year were just amazed by it. We, If there's six or seven of us and we fish hard for three or four days, typically if we caught... 10 paddle fish that was a good fishing trip that was a good three or four days of paddle fishing everybody kind of caught one on average and you're only allowed they only give out 500 keep tags a year for where we fish so out of seven people maybe one or two of us might have a keep tag uh this year i was the only one in the group that had a keep tag and Unfortunately, the first one I caught was a bigger female, about 80 pounds. Generally, we usually like to let these bigger females go and try to target 30, 40 pound males. They're just better eating and less uh, damage to the population. You know, you don't want to keep the big females, they're spawning age. But in most years, it's so hard to catch these fish, and you never know if you're going to catch another one, that usually the first one you catch, if you have a keep tag, you just tag the first one you catch, just because you never know if you're going to get another one. Well, the first two days of fishing, we were just drifting up and down the river, uh, just trying to going through typical holes we usually fish through, um, and we, we caught like four or five the first couple days. We were, we were getting some occasionally and I landed my keeper and tagged it and it was kind of, we were just down to catch and release from there. Uh, but as we were drifting along, I was using this rig, I was able to find this hole right up against the bank and the paddlefish were just stacked up in this hole. There was 30 to 50 paddlefish just sitting in this hole. We tried drifting by it a couple times to see if we could catch them out of there. And finally we decided just to pull into shore and see if we could cast from shore and catch them. And, you know, I said we caught maybe five the first two days the second two days after we found this hole and went to shore fishing, we brought in 25 of them. It only, if you went up to that hole and spent 20, 30 minutes casting, you were, you could get one. It, and anytime it started getting slow, I could get in the boat, shine the unit up into that hole and say, yeah, there's still 10 or 12 of them in that hole or no, they've kind of moved out. And we'd take a break for a couple hours. I'd go out and shine the system up the hole and say, okay, yeah, there's 20 or 30 more fish stacked up in there. We'd, we could start casting right into that hole and start bringing them out. So I have no doubt that this, this, that this thing found us a new hole to fish in that we would have never probably found without it. And we're going to camp right in that spot from now on because it's such a productive hole in a great camping location that normally nobody probably would stop at. So that was my first experience with this unit. 
uh, and everybody was very impressed with the portable setup liked how it worked um, the only problem was is I didn't have any good place to mount the transom or the transducer on I kind of would just hold the pole in my hand and stick it in the water and turn it around and say okay I can see as we were drifting along and say okay I can see some over there in that hole there's we're going over some you could really I mean these are five foot long fish so they showed up very easy you can see it on that hunting river monster video uh, these large fish and I always thought they just stayed on the bottom and were bottom feeders but if you got to watch them you got to see how much they moved up and down in the water column um just swimming around and I never thought that was a habit of theirs I thought they were strictly pretty much just held to the bottom and didn't swim around I mean you you could see them come to the surface once in a while and roll but I thought that was kind of an oddity for them you know and after you see them swimming around up and down the water column it kind of changed my understanding of how that fish acts you know and I probably once again I never would have seen that without this system so it's like I said, I, I found myself enjoying just watching how the fish act as much as I did catching fish. I could I could be entertained just by watching the unit and what was going on. Something my co-fisherman might not have liked because I probably wasn't putting them on the fish as much as I normally do, but I was being entertained. Um, far as... All the other fishing experiences I had over the summer, it was kind of a tough summer. We had, seemed to have a tough time finding the fish this year. We couldn't find a couple areas where we could consistently pull fish out. Like I said, I'm, I'm not as diehard a fisherman as I used to be in my early 20s and early 30s where I could go out and fish for 14 hours and spend all day in the boat and be just fine uh now that i'm in my mid 40s i kind of enjoy just relaxing at the cabin for some of the day little barbecue a little beer drinking with friends so my fishing is generally cut to about four or five hours a day just hitting the usual holes that we've always historically had good luck at which anybody who fishes fort peck lake knows every year with the ch huge changes it takes in lake level, your fishing holes move all the time. Like what was a great producing location one year, you go there the next year and there's nothing. It just, every year it changes and moves. The colors change on what the fish are biting on. So unless you're one of them tournament guys that spends every day, five or six hours a day, hunting them down, finding the new holes, finding the different structure that's changed with the lake level. Fort Peck is a very difficult lake to consistently get walleye for a casual fisherman. Um, it's a great lake because a lot of 30 inch plus walleyes come out of that lake. We have huge walleyes and it seems like you either catch 20 inchers or you're catching 30 inch plusers. They just seem to get huge really fast. You don't seem to catch a lot of 24, 25s. It's a lot of little guys and the, the occasional really big one, big females. So it's a fun lake. It's a challenging lake, but if you're hunting for trophy sized walleyes, it's a great place to go. Um, if you want to catch a lot of 24, 25 inchers, go to Sakakawea Lake in North Dakota. You'll go out and can catch them 24 inchers all day long in a matter of a few hours. They're really thick over there. They just don't get as big. But if you're looking for that one big wall, wall mounter, 33, 34, 35 inch walleye, Fort Peck is a better place to go. Um, like I said in other videos, uh, I've used this bottom bouncing. I've used it pulling crankbaits. I've used it pulling downriggers and every application I tried, 
it worked very well as long as I wasn't so far behind the boat with the rig that it just couldn't see it anymore. Um, but if you, like I said, if you stayed within 50, 60 foot of the boat, might have to use really deep diving crankbaits to get down to 20 feet within 50 feet of the boat, but there are crankbaits out there that can do it. You could see this rig and you could see fish coming off the bottom or following behind it and start trying to do different actions to trigger them to bite, whether it's pumping the rod, just letting it go slack, you know, try different things and see if you can get the fish to react. Sometimes it worked, sometimes something didn't, you know. Maybe you need to change colors, maybe a different kind of pattern will work better, but it's way different when you can see the fish, and you know fish are either following it, and I mean, there are sometimes you'd go by school of fish and they wouldn't react to it at all. Even smallmouth bass or perch. You could go by them, you could see the school of them swimming around. Sometimes you'd see 12 smallmouth bass come shooting up off the bottom, coming after your crankbait. And sometimes you'd go right through a school of perch or smallmouth and they wouldn't even touch it. So. It can give you, if you know the fish are there and you know you went through them, you could see how they're reacting. And maybe you can decide, maybe I need to try a different presentation, a different color, um, try something different. But it definitely shows you, gives you more information than what you get off of a traditional uh, sonar. So overall, I couldn't have been more pleased with what I had my setup, what I did for the year. I, I, I said it was kind of a slow year. We had a couple really good days where we were getting into the walleye. And for the amount of time I spent fishing, I thought it was still pretty good. We've had better years when the bite was just better all around the whole lake, but it's fishing. You never, it's never guaranteed what you're gonna go get much even no matter how much time you spend out there so <clears throat> if you have any questions or different you know functions of how things work like i said far like this has a forward looking like right now this transistor or transducer is in a forward looking view if it's flat across the top it's looking straight ahead in 45 degrees behind it you can tilt it one click down and then it goes into downward mode where it's looking uh, what did it be 65 degrees to the front and 65 degrees to the back and I, I never really liked this orientation because you you can't seem to adjust the depth of it it kind of gets fixed for the width the wider you view the the depth auto adjusts for the width so if you're want to look 60 foot wide and they're only in 15 foot of water you're, you're looking at a very narrow depth you know, it. You, you can't adjust the width and keep the depth all the way at the bottom of the screen. It kind of auto-adjusts for however wide you're looking. So if you want to look wide, you better be in deeper water. You can't look really wide in shallow water without it shrinking down the depth range, which you lose a lot of your detail. So I always kind of kept it in the forward-looking view. Uh, looking straight ahead because that one you could adjust how deep you wanted to be looking how far away you wanted to be looking uh, so it, it just seemed a better setup and uh, you could kind of maximize your screen size to what you're wanting to look at so that's kind of how I generally kept it and for the most part I was always looking more behind the boat 
with the 45 degrees looking ahead that always kind of allowed me to see if see suspended fish coming up or fish on the bottom that was looking far enough ahead to look for the fish I wanted to see one thing I can say for certain is these units need to be mounted on their own mast you lose so much functionality if you mount this hard mount this thing to your trolling motor mast to your transom all the functionality you lose doing that ruins a lot of the usefulness of this thing it it, it just is not going to function that much more outstanding than what any other fish finder out in the market can do but if you mount this on your own its own standalone mast where you can point it and go exactly where you're looking and hold that angle like while your trolling motors up there spinning around trying to hold a digital anchor and it's constantly moving if it was mounted to that mast you would you can never see know where it's going and hold on to a certain spot to see your school of fish in front of you or something you're trying to target cast at so if you get one of these units figure out a way to put it on its own mast whether it's never going to come in or out of your boat or not it needs to be on its own mast i, I can't stress that enough if you see any videos of guys that have it hard mounted to their trolling motor and they're they're still gonna love it but if they had it on its own mast there's nothing that comes close to it in my opinion I mean for what you can do with it and I said I, what little time I had with it I was amazed with it you know and I'm I wasn't out there fishing 14 hours a day all day trying a hundred different kind of presentations and you know slip bobbers and casting into weed piles and under docks and you know the few applications i tried it worked outstanding so first year do not regret buying it at all i got this unit this is like i said the 93 sv unit it typically goes for nine hundred to a thousand dollars i got this on sale for six hundred um the live scope transducer last year that thing was retailing for around fifteen hundred dollars uh, my sister works at a wholesale wholesale distributor for uh, salt water equipment luckily they were carrying this so i was able to get her employee discount basically and picked up that unit for twelve hundred dollars now that it's been out for a year you might start seeing these come on sale at something like last year it was tough just to find these they were going off the shelf as fast as they were coming out so i was pretty lucky knowing somebody that could get one before it even hit the hit the shelf so kind of lucky in that situation on what i could save money wise um, but i quite regularly see this 93 sv unit on sale at cabela's shields bass pro uh, it's not uncommon to see that go on sale for six hundred dollars so keep an eye out um all this cooler setup with the mast cost me around two hundred dollars even with the two batteries or 55 i might be up to like 250 in it with after some modifications but really not much more than what your basic ice fishing setup is which might be a little bit smaller but it only has one battery with it that's probably not that large a battery like i said those are usually 12 volt 9 amp hour 12 amp hour these are 15 amp hour so 
little more of an upsize of batteries and I got two of them that like I said probably would last eight to ten hours of fishing uh, especially if you turned off all the accessories on the unit turned off the GPS if you're just sitting there jigging there's no need for GPS the clock temperature if you shut off all them external systems don't hook up your traditional down looking sonar honestly I hardly ever use that uh, where I mount this in the front of my boat I have the trolling motor traditional sonar screen sits right here next to the unit so I can see that traditional down looking sonar off the trolling motor right next to the live scope so why is there any reason to look at anything but the live scope on this with that setup and here i had the hummingbird lake maps so i have one of the best lake maps out there traditional sonar and the live scope don't i didn't hardly use this thing for anything else other than just the live scope i could take care of the other electronics external of that but like I said, honestly, you will get so much entertainment out of just watching that live scope and looking at weed structures and fish coming in and out and following your line that you can kind of get distracted just by watching that thing. Like I said, I, I had days I was entertained without catching a single fish. So it was, it was definitely a fun summer just seeing how all this thing worked. Um, well, I definitely rambled on too long. I don't know if anybody will watch a 47 minute long video of me jabbering away, but hopefully you got some ideas and whether this is a unit for you or not, and whether you want to build a portable unit like this or not. Um, if you have any questions, put them down below. I, I'll eventually get to all of them. I try not to not answer anything i don't have that many subscribers or questions coming along i'll i'm not a rep for garmin i'm not getting paid anything by igloo or anybody this i'm just a your average fisherman out there trying to come up with what works best and the cheapest for me so i'll give you my honest opinions and if you think of a, something you would like me to try before maybe you buy it, if I can get out there this summer and give it a whirl, I'll give it a go. Like I said, I'm not, not a professional fisherman. I'm not out there every weekend hitting it as much as I'd like to be. Maybe when I'm retired, I can be out there every much that much. But right now, it's as my vacation allows and good weather. But thank you for watching my video. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a little something. Maybe change your mind, yes or no. Do I want to spend that much on a Garmin unit? They are pricey, but we're fishermen. We waste a lot of money just to go catch some fish that we could buy for way cheaper. So our we're our own, own self-stupidity out there sometimes, but it's not about how much money you spend. It's how much you enjoy it. So I, I did not regret... The $2,500 I put into this unit last year, I thought it was great entertainment for what I got out of it. And hopefully I got it for more years to come. We'll talk to you later. Bye.